The function of erythrocytes is primarily for respiratory gas transport. And they do this with the, um, by using the protein-based hormone called hemoglobin that's found within all red blood cells. And that hemoglobin amount, the normal amount in males should be eight, 13, 18 grams per 100 milliliters of blood and a little lower for females as we would expect. Now each hemoglobin molecule has two main components. The first main component is that it has a red heme pigment and that's bound to a protein globin chain. Now this globin chain is composed of uh, different polypeptide chains and the heme pigment is bonded to each of these globin chains. Now it says here that the hemoglobin binds reversibly with oxygen. And what that means is oxygen can attach to the hemoglobin when necessary and it can be unattached from the hemoglobin when it's ready to move into the tissues, for example. So let's talk about each hemoglobin molecule. Each hemoglobin molecule itself can transport four oxygen molecules and there are 250 million hemoglobin molecules for each red blood cell. And what that actually means is that one red blood cell then can transport one billion oxygen molecules because of that we just have to multiply the 250 million by four. So that's an incredible amount. So it, um, it tells us that when somebody has anemia, that's a decrease in hematocrit, that's going to significantly reduce the amount of oxygen that they can transport. And the opposite end of the spectrum is polycythemia. And that means that there is too many red blood cells can be a deadly condition. So when the, um, let's look at the first thing that happens, when oxygen is going to be loaded into the lungs, when we first breathe in oxygen, it diffuses into the blood vessels from the alveoli and the oxygen combines with the hemoglobin in that red blood cell. It's at this point that the blood is a ruby red, scarlet red color. Now as the hemoglobin travels throughout the bloodstream, it gets to eventually to the tissues where the unloading is going to occur. It's at this point where we have the form of deoxyhemoglobin formed. And deoxyhemoglobin is reduced hemoglobin. Now the blood is a dark red color. And that's what's found in the venous system. So remember I mentioned in the first video that arterial blood is going to have a bright red color. In the case of venous blood, it's dark uh, red color. I'll just move this down here so you can see it. So the carbon dioxide is loading in the tissues and it's doing the opposite of the oxygen unloading in the tissues. Now, red blood cells, they're originally going to be produced in the red bone marrow. And this process is called hematopoiesis. You may also see hemopoiesis, but essentially means the same thing. And hematopoiesis is the formation of red blood cells that occurs from the red bone marrow. And in adults, we find this in the axial skeleton, in the girdles of the hip, in the proximal epiphyses of the humerus, and the femur. This is the reason that when they remove red bone marrow, they inject a needle into the hip area. It's a very painful procedure. So this process of hematopoiesis begins with stem cells. The stem cells are called hemocytoblast. And at this point, they are they have not differentiated, meaning they have not yet picking a specific blood cell pathway. So this process of hematopoiesis, it's for all formed elements. But there's a branch of this process called 
erythropoiesis, and that's what's shown on this slide. Beginning with the stem cell, the non-differentiated cell called the hemocytoblast, then there are, are different various chemicals, different factors that are going to cause this cell to become committed or basically make a decision to develop in the direction of a red blood cell. So the next part of this pathway during development that's going to occur is we have to think about what the main job of the red blood cell is. And it's to produce a mass amount of hemoglobin. It's almost like it's a large bag of hemoglobin. So that hemoglobin we know is a protein. And remember from AMP1 you learn that ribosomes are responsible for synthesizing proteins. So the hemoglobin accumulates. Once there's enough hemoglobin, then phase three occurs, the ejection of the nucleus. This is a very important phase because one characteristic about red blood cells is that they are amyotic. And they're a, not abiotic, amyotic. And they're amyotic primarily because there is no nucleus. As we see in phase three of the development, the nucleus is ejected. So a very important part of this process to know is that the amount of reticulocytes is a very important indicator for the rate of erythropoiesis. In the hospital, sometimes they will actually do this test to see what the percent of reticulites are. And a healthy amount is 1 to 2 percent reticulocytes. So for the regulation and the requirements for erythrocytes, the main requirement is the hormone, which is erythropoietin. And we'll take a look at that on the next slide. And there's also important dietary requirements, things like um, nutrients, amino acids, lipids, important B vitamins, folic acid, and of course iron because that's the center of the, um, the very center of the hemoglobin itself. So when there's a loss of red blood cells, this could lead to tissue hypoxia. Tissue hypoxia is a decrease in oxygen by the tissue. Basically means there's more demand from the tissue for oxygen. And that signal is going to cause an increase of red blood cell formation. Too many red blood cells can increase the blood viscosity, so very thick, sludgy blood, and this can be a disorder called polycythemia. And the normal amount of red blood cell production should be about greater than 2 million per second, an amazing number. So the kidneys are going to regulate erythropoiesis, erythro erythrocyte production, but they're going to tell the red bone marrow to start producing red blood cells. So let's look at that process in our next slide here. And we see that in this particular slide, uh, the stimulus, if it's hypoxia, that stimulus is going to signify, it's going to um, tell the kidney to start releasing the hormone called erythropoietin. Erythropoietin, or usually um, it's abbreviated as EPO, is going to stimulate red bone marrow production, and that's going to increase the amount of red blood cell production and bring us back into balance. Now, there's disorders where athletes do this to try to get an edge. Of course, we think of Lance Armstrong as, our, as an example of this. But the use of EPO will increase hemat the hematocrit amount, and it's considered to be a, um, an illegal drug for use in athletic events. But it does cause more red blood cells, so it makes sense that it increases the amount of the oxygen carrying capacity. But it's a, it's a great risk factor because the hematocrit could go up to 45 to even 65% with dehydration even increasing this more because that's the lack of water that's in the bloodstream, 
This could lead to clotting, stroke, or even heart failure. So it can be a very bad thing. 